and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It is a kind of interesting little moment because as I'm sitting here, markets just hit a new all-time high in the Dow. Um, uh, so that's not probably something most of us were expecting to come this week, but the market is up about 500 points on the week in the Dow. Both S&P and Dow are at all-time highs. Uh, you go back to the beginning of February, um, it's not what people were expecting. and. Uh, particularly throughout March, April, May, as the extension of trade war fears and heightened volatility in the market uh, got confused with, with fundamental um, undertones in the market. And I do believe the market had gotten a little overstretched back in early February. Uh, I believe that uh, interest rates going higher had to get repriced, work its way through the system. Um, I, I didn't buy the higher inflation theme then, but I certainly understood that it was conversationally relevant. Uh, but all that to say, um, it seems to me that the explanation for the uh, renewed price appreciation is the market's confidence that this uh, next round of tariffs in this uh, trade war with China um, are likely to be resolved after the midterm elections. There is a, a, a high degree of optimism that there will be trade talks between the U.S. and China and that some compromise will be reached and that that will come at some point after the midterm elections. That is the thesis that we would we certainly hope is true and that we suspect is true. I may not be as optimistic as some, but I, I think that's the direction that we're headed. And regardless, it's certainly the signal the market's giving. So if that were correct in theory, you, you peel back a little bit and you say, well, if the trade and tariff issues were not looming over this market, meaning the U.S. equity market, then what would the market be focused on? Well, the market would be focused on record earnings, corporate profit growth, record dividends, rep record revenue growth, uh, ongoing margin expansion, profit margins continue to expand. So, uh, and perhaps the extension of all those aforementioned factors caused by GDP growth, uh, you know, really catching wind right now. You put all those things together, there's no reason the market wouldn't be advancing. You get multiple expansion, you get a higher earnings that is being applied to higher multiple, you get higher stock prices. And then for those of us who care about these things, you get higher dividends because of higher profits, leading to greater monetization of the investment risk that we're taking. It's a really good formula. Uh, I think one of the nuances to the story this year has been that this story has been largely monopolized by the United States. In the last five days, Japanese equity markets have been on a tear, but they had been down on the year. They've kind of erased a lot of those losses literally just in the last week. Um, but European equities remain down on the year. British, UK equities down modestly on the year. Chinese equities down a lot on the year and emerging markets down. So it's a, a, a time in which an asset allocator has to maintain the discipline around the fact that we want to be globally diversified equity investors. And you're not expecting every single country and every single market to be performing in concert with one another. Um, you combine that then with what's happening in the fixed income space and so forth. Uh, this is what asset allocation is meant to do. And the last thing any investor ought to be doing right now is abandoning the principle of asset allocation to jump in the lane where the cars are all moving the fastest. Those of you that drive freeways know how that works, and I assure you it works the same for investors as well. So I think you have a really great uh, life principle uh, in being played out in investment markets right now around the efficacy and wisdom and discipline of asset allocation. Um, economically, you're just sort of seeing what happens when one country moves to a dramatically beneficial tax system that, it, uh, that really substantially enhances corporate profits of their constituent companies and other countries don't, you get a divergence in the results that will take place on an after-tax profit basis. That is really the biggest explanation be between the United States and the rest of the world. You add to that the dollar rally and just the currency impact to emerging markets, Japan, Europe, et cetera, it, 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 isn't, it isn't rocket science. Uh, rocket science, I guess, would be predicting what will happen next, but that wouldn't even be rocket science. It'd be gambling, it'd be luck, it wouldn't be sustainable. No free beverages, really stupid idea. Uh, but sure sounds fun to do in hindsight to have guessed what asset class was gonna perform hot last. Um, I would uh, love to lie to you and say that 
that's what we're trying to do, but we're not trying to do it, therefore we're not going to do it. Uh, we are really focused on this asset allocation concept, very pleased with what we're doing within U.S. equities, v even more pleased with those areas like emerging markets and previously Japan that have been struggling because it's given us the opportunity to buy more shares of very attractive risk assets at lower prices. Buying at lower prices is a good thing. If you don't believe me, I'll show you like with math. Okay. Uh, what else do I want to cover this week? The active passive debate is talked about again in DividendCafe.com. Not about equities though this week, but in the uh, aspect of municipal bonds and sort of giving you a little bit of the constructive difference between how a muni bond index works versus an S&P 500 and why an active approach utilizing individual bonds professionally managed with greater transparency, customization, tax management, uh, we think is a far, and, and then you get greater execution and pricing, greater liquidity, um, all of those things we think is very beneficial. Uh, people don't like us talking about 30% of their portfolio as much as they do the equity stuff. A, because generally equities are a larger allocation for a lot of clients than bonds. And B, equities are always a more exciting asset class than bonds. But nevertheless, to, for us to be holistic in the way we view client portfolio, we have to talk about bonds every now and then. And, and there's a good section in Divin Cafe where we do just that. Uh, our argument on Japan is really, really firm right now. Corporate profitability is now up to its healthiest level and getting close to 30 years. Um, their, their easy monetary policy, they reiterated they're going to stay low rates for a longer period of time. Again, I can't imagine that the market was shocked by that. I think that central bank is in a pretty permanent state of accommodation. However, uh, the real issue for us is that we want to have the opportunity to capture dividend growth out of Japanese equities. Dividend growth comes from companies that are growing their own profits and are not paying out uh, an adequate level of that compensation to their investors, to their shareholders. And that's what we think the secular story is in Japan, both in small cap where we do not hedge the currency and in large cap where we do hedge the currency just to sort of maintain a bit more modest approach to what the dollar and yen impact may be. So Japan is still a story that's very much front and center for us. Um, DividendCafe.com this week has a chart of the week that looks at the percentage of technology in the index because of all the price appreciation and then the percentage of profits the technology represents within the index. And when those two things get very disconnected in the past, year 1999 into 2000, you had a big bubble. Now they are disconnecting a little bit, but it's a real little bit. So the two lessons are A, it looks expensive. The capitalization weighting in the index is larger right now than the earnings weighting but just a fraction of what it was when you had the mother of all bubbles 18 years ago. Look at the visual at DividendCafe.com. It may give you a little more color on things. Those are the major things I wanted to cover this week. I will, just by way of housekeeping, really encourage those of you who are interested to go to MarketEpicurean.com. That's MarketEpicurean.com, where I am now, I think, by the time you're listening to this, seven parts or six parts uh, in no, it's six or seven parts into a 10 part series on the financial crisis. And then there's going to be um, successive issues coming out in the week ahead. You know, so, so far we've covered from when Fannie and Freddie went down all the way, you know, through the Lehman and AIG and Merrill and Morgan and Goldman. And then now talking about the, all these extreme measures the Fed was taking. The next couple of issues are going to look at a really dramatic day with Wachovia Bank back in 2008. And uh, we won't forget when Washington Mutual went down, largest bank bankruptcy in history. All of that is covered in the series of short articles, just giving you kind of a, a little blast from the past about the crisis through my eyes. And then we're going to pull it all together early October with a real uh, hard hitting uh, piece on the lessons for investors. So check that out at DividendCafe.com. And then our advice and insights podcast uh, that you have available now uh, is going to deal with the Federal Reserve and the sort of changing of the guard that took place at the Fed um, as a provider of liquidity and the incredible imaginative things that that ended up meaning in the, in the bottom levels of the financial crisis. So that's the rest of the goodies we have for you this week. Please reach out anytime, any questions, any comments. We remain here ready to help. Uh, we love talking to you about this stuff. Thank you for listening and viewing and watching the Dividend Cafe.